two years ago when Battlefield 1 released, I played the War Stories and I was really disappointed. I just thought they were bad in general. Maybe I can make a uh, video about them in particular later. Uh, but I, uh, I heard Battlefield 5 was coming out and I heard it also had those uh, same War Stories in them. I'm just like, hmm, I'm going to see uh, if Battlefield 5 can make the War Stories work. And if they don't, I'm going to compare it to a World War II video game that is good. I recorded all the gameplay of World at War I Needed, and then I went in, uh, played the Battlefield 5 War Stories, recorded all that to uh, collect my data. And I found that Battlefield 5 is garbage as far as the campaign goes. I mean, the multiplayer is pretty good, I'll be honest, but the campaign is just garbage. Why? Well, I'll get into that in just a little bit here. Now, you might be thinking that, like, oh, the multiplayer is good, and that's all really Battlefield is used for. Well, here's what I have to say to that. Eventually, as good as the multiplayer is, it's going to be shut down. Like, the servers are just going to be shut down someday. Take this, for example, Halo 2. It was an old game on the original Xbox. It had a campaign and a multiplayer. The multiplayer was, like, revolutionary. Uh, one of the, like, most played Xbox Live games on the original Xbox. But they shut down the original Xbox servers. So, if that game just had a multiplayer it'd be completely useless. Uh, if it had a crappy campaign like Battlefield 5, then you could still play it. Um, but it wouldn't be enjoyable, of course. But no, Halo 2 has a great campaign. I've played it like 15 times. And as long as you have an original Xbox and uh, electricity, you can play it without internet all you want. It's great. Actually, no, you can play Halo 2 multiplayer on the Master Chief Collection. But yeah, you know, they won't revamp every single online game, you know. So what I'm going to do is compare the games on a few random things, and then I'm going to go through a Battlefield 5 war story. I'm just going to go through one of them. That one should give you a basic idea about how all of them function. Alrighty, let's, let's do it. Yay. Alright, let's start off with something, uh, a, a big, a big difference that these two games have from each other. You know, it's a historical game, and you're going to be fighting in some new historical World War II battles. So they got to give you some context before you go in and start uh, slaying. So this is how Battlefield 5 does it. What they do is they have a blank screen with text over it and barely any music playing. I, I never took any, like, writing classes or anything, but I do know, like, show, don't tell is a thing. So, well, you could show a map. You could show a diagram. Here, you know what? Just take a World at Wars intros for an example here. The rotten cancer of the fascist Reich ravages Europe like a plague. The relentless drive into our motherland steals the lives of men, women, and children alike. The arrogance of their leaders is matched only by the brutality of their soldiers. These are the darkest days of the Nazi occupation. So as you can tell, World at War's intros are miles more entertaining than Battlefield 5's blank screen with text over it. They show really violent actual footage, they show you simulations of what you're going to be fighting against or around. They got these voiceovers of the soldiers you're going to be fighting alongside with, that it gets you motivated, it gets you hating the enemy. I mean, like, the voiceovers combined with the actual footage gives you an idea of what these soldiers go through as well. Every night we lay in a filthy foxhole praying the enemy won't slit our throats. Every day we're spent crawling through the mud and the dirt and our bullets whistle all around. But this is the last time we're going to have to put our lives on the line. This is the enemy's last stand. When we take Shuri Castle, we go home. I just can't believe that Battlefield Five. all they did to give you context, was a blank screen with white text over it. That is the most boring way to give you context to what you're about to be playing. The next thing I want to talk about is brutality. So, you know, it's a video game about a war. Wars are bad, they're brutal, you, you shoot people. Not only that, but this is the most violent and deadly human conflict of all time. 60 million people died. So let's take a look at how these two games handle this. 
let's very quickly take a look at two incidents in Battlefield 5. The first is uh, there's a wounded German soldier and this guy's about to shoot him and his buddy's just like, hey, no, don't do that. It's not worth it. And then we were, I don't know what we're supposed to feel. I guess we're supposed to feel like, oh, wow, those guys are nice. They didn't kill a wounded soldier. Wow, yay, good for them. All right, so another instance is um, they, they try to make comic relief. And if it's bad. There's these two soldiers walking down this road. Then a German who has a gun runs in front of him with his car. Says like, oh, s stop, stop it, stop moving. And then it cuts to the German in the trunk. He's like saying like, oh, help me, get me out of here. So this is forced comedic relief. Like there's no reason those guys couldn't have just shot the German. They had guns. How come the German who had a gun did not shoot those two people? Like, those people obviously did something to get him in the trunk. Why didn't the German just shoot them? And heck, what exactly happened? Like, it, it just cuts straight to the German in the trunk. Now let's take an incident uh, from World at War. There's uh, these uh, three Nazis who are trapped, and they want to surrender. So, you have two options. A merciful option, and like a brutal, oh yeah, the option. Your first option is to shoot them. You know what's significant about that? That's the merciful option. The other option is to burn them alive. Yeah, so if you want a good idea of how you should portray the Second World War, then let's have World at War show us how to do it again. Now, I'm not saying you have to be all brutal and violent when you're making a war story, but chances are this is how it went down most of the time. You know, World at War is so violent, you know, blood splatters everywhere when people get shot, like, limbs will fall off and everything. Like, they'll gun down soldiers who have surrendered. But the problem with Battlefield Five is that they're just a bunch of wimps. Like, you know how when Call of Duty World War Two came out and they said that, oh, we're not having the swastika in the multiplayer? But... At least they had swastikas in their campaign, because, you know, realism. Battlefield 5 doesn't even have swastikas in their campaign. It's replaced with, I don't know what it's called, this little cross thing in the future. Swastika, yes, blah blah blah, it's offensive, but who cares, it's the symbol of the enemy. I like World at War better because it doesn't care if it offends you. It's just like, yeah, fuck you, this is actually how it happened. There's hardly any gore in Battlefield 5, like there's some blood, but it's not as drastic. Like, it just has like this upbeat feeling to it uh, the whole time. I'll get more into detail in that when I review each individual war story. Alright, now on to the next freaking topic. Personal pronoun takes the place of another noun. Alright, I'm going to show you some gameplay from Battlefield 5. I want you to guess what's missing from it. That's right. There's no music! Like, you can barely hear the music, and it's not even that good. Like, before I played Battlefield 5's War Stories, I was just like, wow, uh, the music section of this video, that might be hard to make, because I never took any music classes. I don't really have a professional view of good music versus bad music. But it turns out I have nothing to worry about, because Battlefield 5 hardly has any music in it. It does have music, like you can barely hear it, and like the times you can hear it, it's not that good. Like, World at War, on the other hand, has great music. Like, Call of Duty isn't really known for its musicness. In fact, I think in every other game besides World at War, the music is just kind of bland for the most part. But World at War is definitely an exception to the Call of Duty series. Again, I've taken absolutely no musical classes, so I can't really tell you the difference between good music and bad music. I can just generally tell if it's good or bad. Let's compare the music of Battlefield 5 versus the music of World at War. Alright, here's a sample of Battlefield 5.
Okay, so the thing about that sample is that I can never tell you where that was played during the game. I just found that on YouTube after I searched up the Battlefield 5 soundtrack. It's definitely not something that's going to be motivating players when they're playing an action game where you shoot people and stuff. You see, if you were to play me any music from Battlefield 5 soundtrack, I could never tell you when it was being played. Like, like, uh, I could never tell you, like, oh yeah, that was being played when this was happening. World at War has memorable music. It most definitely puts you in the mood. Oh yeah, here, yeah, let's just play a sample from World at War. Again, I've never taken any music classes, but I think it's clear to say that World at War is better. <laughs> So I don't know why they went with uh, this war story route anyway. We have a bunch of stories to tell and it only took me about an hour and a half to get through each mission. I don't think that gives you time to develop characters or anything. In World at War, you have a total of 15 missions divided into two stories. You have the Americans versus the Japanese and the Soviets versus the Germans. So, the war story I'm going to be going over is Nord Lays, whatever it's called, um, just because that's the first one I played. Okay, so the very first thing we see is this blank screen with text on it that I complained about earlier. Wait a second. Wait a second, they said the word swastika. Does that mean they're gonna have swastikas in the campaign and I was wrong? <laughs> they don't. They don't. I was right. They, they still don't. We then get some weird, I don't know what they are, maybe establishing shots. At first I was just like, what, why are the, why is this like image of water dropping into a singamahoocher here? Well, that's explained at the end of the story, but there's no reason why it should be showed here at the beginning. I, I don't know why they, I don't know why they did that. Alright, so we're inside of a Nazi lab located in Norway. There's this one Nazi, he's interrogating a captured Norwegian resistance member. He's just like, oh, some of our soldiers got killed by one of y'all's resistant members, you best tell us who it is. And then the woman is just like, no, I'll never tell you. And the German's just like, okay, well, hey, you know what, you better talk to me, or else we're gonna have to send you off to Germany, where, you know, it's a shithole in Germany, you might not want to go there. And then he handcuffs her to a chair and leaves her there for some reason. When you first start to be able to play, your first objective is to ski! to an area that's over 700 meters away. Unfortunately, traveling to an area that's hundreds of meters away is a norm for Battlefield 5. Also, apparently you take no fall damage with these skis on. I mean, like, j just look at this. Yeah, I, I don't see how that's possible. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, our objective right now is to find a missing Norwegian resistance member. How do I know this? It just lazily puts that up in your objective bar, Singamahootra, it just says, do this. Like, this is how lazy of a writer you are to write this story. You can't even tell me what I'm supposed to do other than by showing it in the objective bar. Okay, so let's compare this so far to the first mission of World at War. I can say World at War is much more entertaining because, again, you get these cool intros instead of the blank screen with text over it. Then after that, one of the first things you see is one of your comrades getting his throat slit. Then, we are told what to do by one of the characters, not by the objective bar. Grab a rifle. We're gonna tear this place apart. Robot, signal the strike team! Alright, now back to reviewing Nord Galais, whatever the frick it's called. Okay, so now we are about 150 meters away from our objective. And it's just now that we meet enemy resistance. Why couldn't the game just start me at this point right here? What was the point of skiing about 600 meters? 
Okay, and so now the game wants me to be stealthy. They want me to, to use my binoculars to see where people are at. They want me to, like, mark waypoints. Now, I don't play like that. I usually just bull rush through it. Now, I don't have a problem with stealth missions like this. However, this is how about 80% of Battlefield 5's war stories go. It's like stealth missions. You have to use binoculars and scout out. So basically, I'm playing 80% of the campaign how they don't want me to. Now that I've bull rushed through everything that they wanted me to be stealthy through, I have to go to another objective that's about 500 meters away. I mean, I can respect this because there's actually enemy resistance along the way. However, I don't know why you just didn't add that to the original 700 meters at the beginning of the game. Okay, so we sneak our way into the laboratory. We're about to open the door and then, uh-oh, there's a German and he has a gun. It looks like we're done for. Uh, we're actually good because he's a fucking retard and discharges us. I mean, like, he has a gun. Again, he could, he could just shoot us, but no, he wants to be stupid, so we end up stabbing him. Convenient. Convenient. So she busts open the door, and we find out that the missing Norwegian resistance member is actually this girl's mom, and the girl that was featured in the beginning of the story. Mom's just like, okay, the Germans are making something terrible here. We need to stop them. Take. Gather. So now we're sneaking through the laboratory and the mom says, Oh, I need to find something important in here. She then spends about two minutes ruffling through a drawer trying to find these, like, documents or whatever. And while she's doing that, we have to fend off the enemies. Okay, so World of War does something like this as well. Like, you have to wait until a character does a certain thing and your life's depending on it. In Battlefield 5, we have to wait until your mom finds a couple of papers that we don't even care about. And in the time she's searching for them, we only face about 10 German soldiers. In World at War, it's kind of more exciting. The situation is, oh, I need to get this iron door pried open before this giant tidal wave comes and wipes us all out. Alright, so now we see your mom placing dynamite on one of the pieces of machinery. And then she says, oh yeah, we need to sabotage the entire laboratory. And then you're like, no mom, this isn't important. We need to get out of here. And then your mom says, no, you don't understand. We need them to stop making this heavy water. We find out what heavy water is later into the story. We were then set outside to go destroy some stuff. I just want to point out that there's a Nazi with a flamethrower and he's trying to kill me with it with all just like electrical equipment around. I guess they just don't care about that all or something, I don't know. We then destroy what we have to destroy. Then we get an objective, which is to rendezvous with our mom at this waypoint. Just like earlier, I- Frick you! Just like earlier, I only know this because the game told me in the objective bar. I checked back through the game even this time to see if I missed anything. However, I didn't. Oh, also, where's the point that we need to travel to? It's 500 meters away, and we have to travel down the same exact pass we took to come here. We were about to approach the waypoint when our mom just appears out of nowhere. I mean, just take a look at this. Come in. She then tells us to duck alongside of the road. A truck passes by, and I don't know how they don't see us because we're in a well-lit area. So now that the truck didn't see us, we're gonna try to run across the bridge. But uh-oh, a spotlight has spotted us. Alright, so that truck we saw earlier turns around, some Germans get out of it. And then the guy who tried to interrogate your mom earlier is just like, no, don't kill them. I think what they're trying to do is paint him as a sympathetic Nazi. At the beginning, he said he didn't want her to be sent off to Germany. Now he's trying to save these two people from getting shot. However, later into the story, we'll see how that's all ruined. Okay, so the mom sneaks her daughter the important document. Still, we have no idea what they are. And then she pushes her off the bridge, and she falls and needs to escape. As soon as we get back into the gameplay, we can see another objective that's only told to us through the objective bar. However, this is where you could actually make it make sense. We're stuck in the middle of the night in a snowstorm. The person you're playing as may have the instinct to do anything for survival. However, you as the player may not. So if you were to put something up there like, oh, find warmth, 
that would be acceptable because the person you're playing as would be thinking that in their head, however it's a game, and you can't tell exactly what they're thinking. However, we are told to deliver Satchel to Dead Drop. We were never told anywhere else to do that, we just automatically know how to do that for some reason. We then have to try to sneak past a bunch of soldiers. Then I am introduced to one of the dumbest gameplay mechanics I've ever seen. You can freeze to death if you don't find a source of heat in time. Yeah, in World at War you can burn people alive while you're driving a tank. In Battlefield 5 you wimpily try to sneak past all the enemies, and then you can freeze to death if you don't do it fast enough. Then you find a house you can take cover from the storm in. But uh oh, there's a Nazi in it. He reaches for his gun very, very slowly. You kill him and then, yeah, you get the rest and regenerate yourself. Once you wake up, you finally actually read the documents your mom gave to you and we get to find out what they mean. We learn that the water we saw flashes of at the beginning of the game is something called heavy water that the Germans are using to make an atomic bomb. We have to stop them before it gets shipped to Germany and their evil plans can be carried out. We then hike atop a mountain and find out that we need to destroy three things that are all several hundred meters away from each other. Oh my gosh! So we destroy a bunch of shit and then we have to ski a couple hundred meters across the lake. We come across the little fortress thing on the and we see that your mom is being forced into a car and being taken off somewhere. You get spotted by a German again. He's just a retard. Instead of shooting you, he tries to whip you with his gun and it just ends up with him dying. So then they run off with your mom and you have to go chase him down. So the game just tells you to destroy some trucks and then you destroy those trucks. And then a freaking submarine just bursts out of the frozen water. So they load your mom onto the submarine and you get into a small firefight with the Germans. And I have to admire the Germans move on this one time because uh, I would think at this point that they would try to chuck their guns at the woman to try to hit her instead of shooting her. So yeah, congrats Germans, you get a one star, yay. So this is the part where I said earlier where, you know, they were trying to paint this guy as like a sympathetic or like nicer Nazi. Just goes down the shitter. So your mom tries to escape and he just shoots her in the back. I guess this makes sense for the story better than him being sympathetic at this part, but I don't know why you tried to paint him as a merciful person near the beginning. Okay, so here's the epic conclusion. So, you're both pinned down. There's nowhere to run. However, your mom has a plan. Yep. She just kills herself, and that's the end of the story. We get some history lessons from the blank screen with white text over it again, and that's it. So all of the Battlefield 5 war stories are like this. Except for The Last Tiger, I'll get into that uh, later. Um, so yeah, this, that was a uh, particularly boring. I don't think this was the best way to tell the story of a member of the Norwegian Resistance. Uh, I'm not too educated on that topic, but um, I'm pretty sure if you sat down for a longer amount of time, you could have thought of more ways to make it entertaining. Okay, now we're going to go over Mission of World at War. So the mission we will be reviewing is Vendetta. This is the first mission where you take the Russian perspective. So again, we already start off better with these badass intros. Is in the very first thing we see is our comrades being murdered in front of us while we can just sit there and watch it and play dead. Also, unlike Battlefield 5, they make use of music! So yeah, look at this scene and just imagine if Battlefield 5 did this, they would have no music over it to add any effect to it.
So you start to crawl forward. You have no idea how the frick you're going to get out of this situation. But then you see movement. It turns out that this fucking badass was in your exact situation the whole time. Why is he a badass? Well, here's a line of dialogue from him in a future mission. Jenna! What is going on? These men are trying to surrender! Look around you, Chernoff! Do you think these men will be denied their revenge? Death comes only two ways. Fast or slow. Believe me, it is your choice. Chernoff, you should learn from Dimitri. He understands the nature of us. So Reznov explains to you that he's been trying to kill this one general for about three days, but he just never had the chance to do it, and now he wants you to aim for him because his hand has a boo-boo now. So this is where, I guess, the theme of the Russian side of the game is set up. It's all about avenging the massacre at Stalingrad and just giving the Nazis a bad old time. Like this right here. Ready? Shoot! No! Again! So we're off to find a better sniping position so we can kill the general that he's been trying to kill for three days. And we get this little segment here that reminds us that war is shit. This place once echoed with conversations of friends and lovers. No longer. Mark my words, comrade. One day things will change. We will take the fight to their land. To their people. To their blood. However, your plans of sneaking around are ruined because you're spotted by a sniper. Now actually, gameplay-wise, I would actually admit that this is a little annoying. But it just crushes your chances of trying to roam around sneakily and picking off the general. Good hunting! The patrols will surely have heard those shots. We need to get moving. So you keep trying to sneak through this building. However, there's a patrol outside because they were alerted to the gunshots. So you both get down and try to avoid them. And like any stealth section, they should just ignore you. Nope, they try to burn you alive. Hey, you find us! We need to leave you now! Hit the floor! So you escape the burning building, and then you're about to die, but then you get saved. Hooray! Dimitri, we thought you were among the dead in the massacre at the square. He was. Among them, but not one of them. So now the scarce remains of Russian soldiers are gonna try to push through the city. And we have to go up and cover them with our sniper rifles. And this is where the all-out brutality towards the Germans begins. Hold your fire. Do you see the flamethrowers? You must choose your moment. Exploding the fuel tank will incinerate anyone standing nearby. So you get into your sniping position, you kill the general, and yay, it's the end of the mission. No, you get attacked, you narrowly escape. And from here on out, it's just massacring Germans. You see how things have changed, my friend. Now it is their land. Their So basically, the sum it up, World at War is just generally more entertaining than Battlefield 5. Not only that, but it's not scared to be, I guess, politically incorrect, if, is, is that the correct term? Like it, it, uh, like, it doesn't care that it's so brutal. Unlike Battlefield 5, Battlefield 5 is just a wimp when it comes to portraying history for some reason. Like, really, it still freaking baffles me that they refrain from putting the swastika, the symbol of the freaking enemy that you're playing against. They didn't even put that in the freaking campaign. Heck, if it, if it was like just a marketing issue, because apparently they can't have swastikas in shithole countries like Germany. That's, that's weird, isn't it? But you absolutely have to like go out and like make like a different version for countries that allow it, because this is just ridiculous. 
World at War actually develops good and interesting characters because one, the writers are actually skilled, obviously, and two, they have more than an hour and a half to tell a story. As far as gameplay in Battlefield 5, you just run to objectives and like destroy something. At World of War is actually entertaining, it's just action, action, yeah, mmm. Another minor detail, I also noticed that Battlefield 5 will take you out of the experience, I guess. Battlefield 5 has hit markers, I don't know why that's in a campaign, it seems like you just want to make sure you, you kill the enemy yourself. There, I'm pretty sure there's an option to turn it off, but I think the default option should be for it to be off, so I'm sorry, I don't like it. Another thing is that in World at War, 99.999999% of the time, any gun is a one-shot headshot kill because, you know, realism. In Battlefield 5, this is not the case. So yeah, it's just not immersive at all. So, is World at War perfect? No, of course it's not perfect. One thing that really bugs me about World at War is the unrealistic gun recoil. Look at this footage of the M1 Garand. There's like no recoil in it. However, the M1 Garand has a lot of freaking recoil. Now, I'm a gun guy, but I've actually never shot an M1 Garand. However, what I have shot is an M1A. Basically what that is, it's the civilian variant of the updated version of the M1 Garand, the M14. Now the M1 Garand fires a 30 6 round. The M1A fires a 308. The 308 is basically a little less powerful version of the 30 6 so it's gonna have a little less recoil. Now watch this footage of me shooting basically a gun that's less powerful than the 30 6 M1 Garand, and look how much recoil it has. Another thing I noticed is um, that guns that don't have a lot of recoil in real life actually have more recoil in the game. Like the MP40 was designed to have like no recoil, and in this game it has a lot of recoil. And honestly, that's it. That, that's about it. There's probably other things I can't think of. That's it. Okay, so back in November, when I started to make this review, there was only three war stories available, and I based uh, this review off of those three stories. However, a couple weeks after the game's release, another war story released. And it's actually kind of good. Kind of. Kind of good. Kind of. Surprisingly enough, you play as a Nazi in this one, uh, they, they don't show swastikas, but you can play as a Nazi, that makes sense. Gameplay is improved in general, there's a lot less running to objectives and destroying something or whatever. You're also in a tank 90% of the time, so that's cool. The area you travel through is a little bit more encased than World at War's tank section, but it, it's still pretty good. But what shines about this story is its story. Again, there's only about an hour in which you can develop stuff, but nevertheless, it's actually sad. Alright, so let me explain this briefly here. So at the start of the mission, you get into the tank with your squad, and there's this kid, and it's kind of obvious that he's just a frightened little kid who was probably forced to fight in this war. So later on, you get attacked. You run inside of a destroyed building for cover, and they decide to send this kid out there to scout out the way. And you can really feel the tension in this scene. Wir werden uns nicht lange halten können. Jemand muss da raus uns einen Weg suchen. Schicken Sie Hartmann. Wovon zur Hölle reden Sie da? Der Mann ist nicht in der Verfassung. Vertrauen Sie auf unsere Stärke. Das waren doch eure Worte, oder? Keine Schwäche, keine Sentimentalität. Oh ja, dort nochmal. Sie sind zu wichtig. Das können wir nicht riskieren. Und ich, ich bediene das Geschütz. Dann mache ich das eben. Nein, Sie müssen fahren. Aber Hartmann, der ist doch eh angeschlagen. Austauschbar. Wollen Sie ihn wirklich da rausschicken? Hartmann! Ja? Steigen Sie aus dem Panzer. 
Suchen Sie uns da draußen einen Weg ins Freie. Ach Gott, nochmal, Müller, nein, der Mann ist nicht in der Verfassung. Bitte, Peter, ich kann wirklich... Raus aus dem Panzer, Hartmann. Ich möchte, dass Sie Ihre Pflicht tun. Das gilt für jeden hier. So the squad is looking at him while he's trying to scout out the area, and he he just disappears. You, you, you don't know where he went, and you just go on playing for like 20 minutes, not knowing where this guy is. You're kind of wondering where he is the entire time. And then this happens. But wait, there's more. That Another thing is the end. Uh, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna play it. Gesprengt. Die wollen uns hier verrecken lassen. Das weißt du nicht, Kerz. Komm, wir müssen jetzt... Was? Stärke zeigen. Hä? Ach Gott. Sieh dich doch um, Peter. Gott, steh uns bei. Alles, woran wir geglaubt haben. Alles, was wir dafür getan haben. Es ist vorbei. Nein, Kerz. Komm. Tu das nicht, Kerz. Peter, es ist vorbei. Er war ein Verräter. Kerz! Kerz! That was a very emotional ending. I wasn't expecting that for- OH YOU GOTTA BE KIDDING ME!